Hi everyone. If you're new to the channel, I'm Father Tony Silvia. I'm the president of Gnostic NYC and I do most of the behind the scenes work on all of the videos on the Gnostic NYC network. Uh, but today I'm going to start a vlog because vlogs are cool. And because you guys have donated uh, more than $15 per video or podcast episode on our Patreon campaign. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you as we go along with this experiment in vlogging. Recently, I don't know if you've been following this, there's been a debate going on between some scholars about the idea of Gnostics as intellectuals, the ancient Gnostics specifically. Now, what I didn't know is that there's this whole kind of stigma uh, on the study of Gnosticism. Some scholars consider Gnosticism to be a complete waste of time as a field of study because Gnosticism, they feel, was largely inconsequential to the development of Western thought. Links for all these blog posts will be in the description. There's four of them. The first one is Dr. Larry Hurtado, who made the point that because Gnostics didn't engage in debate and argument and discussion with members of other religious faiths, that he thought he thinks that the Gnostics were not intellectual in the sense that the other mainstream Christian uh, thinkers were at the time. He points to people like Irenaeus, who were actively trying to explain Christianity to the masses, to the, the wider community, and he says that the Gnostics didn't do that. In other words, they didn't dumb down their religion for the masses. He even went so far to call it esoteric mumbo-jumbo. What followed was a response from one of my favorite scholars, Dr. April DeConnick. And Dr. DeConnick made the point that there were all kinds of Gnostics who were engaging in this kind of debate. Uh, you know, people like uh, Porphyry, people like the, uh, the letter to Flora, Ptolemy's little letter to Flora, and all kinds of people who were actively engaging in this kind, this exact kind of debate and discussion and argument and apologetics that Dr. Hurtado was talking about. Dr. Hurtado then changes tack a little bit and says that all of the people that April DeConnick mentions in her blog post weren't actually Gnostics. He goes on to cite that, you know, Gnostic versus, you know, Christian heretic kind of debate that's been going on in the scholarly community and says, well, these people don't actually fit into the category of Gnostic, therefore they're just Christian heretics. Enter Philip L. Tite from the Bulletin for the Study of Religion. Uh, he says that by categorizing the Gnostic intellectuals as Christian heretics and leaving out all of the anonymous, you know, texts. So by saying that everything we have a name for uh, in the Nag Hammadi Library and the other Gnostic texts, everybody who we can ascribe authorship, um, by Dr. Hurtado saying that those are Christian heretics and then all of the texts that are anonymous calling them Gnostic, uh, he essentially gets to define the category without, you know, uh, without having to answer to anybody else about it. Mm, water. Dr. Tite says that the intellectual climate of late antiquity, um, especially among the Neoplatonic and Neopythagorean circles, these texts actually made a great deal of sense. So they wouldn't need to have been explained in the way that Christianity would have been explained, because Gnosticism is so steeped in Neoplatonism and Neopythagoreanism, using their symbols and their texts and their words and embellishing and bringing in some of the Christian story. So for ancient people, this wasn't anything new. This would have been intellectual discourse because they would have understood natively all of these things that they were talking about. So by applying a modern standard of scientific inquiry to an ancient group of people, uh, Dr. Hurtado is essentially trying to use the modern system of morality to determine whether or not the ancient Gnostics were actually worthwhile. And so, Trying to jam that square peg into that round hole, Tite argues, is problematic. Now, for some of my comments, were all of the ancient Gnostics brilliant intellectuals, geniuses with high IQs? Undoubtedly, no. Uh, people are people, and people were people back then, and you have all kinds of varying degrees of intelligence and commitment and, and all of that uh, intellectual discourse stuff that Hurtado is talking about. 
But like the ancient Neoplatonists, those of us who live with a modern Gnosticism today, we can read the Gnostic texts and we can understand that what they're talking about is something internal and mystical, and something that doesn't necessarily translate well to explanation in, a, in an intellectual discourse kind of a sense. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist and that doesn't mean it's not real. It also doesn't mean that the Gnostics weren't intellectuals, it just means they were approaching the subject in a different way. And as far as modern Gnosticism goes, I have had the pleasure to meet in person with many, many Gnostic thinkers of our day and discuss with them either through our video shows or at our Joe and I conclaves or just, you know, meeting up with somebody for coffee when they come to town. I count myself lucky to be the stupidest Gnostic in the room wherever I go. So I think that we can say that modern Gnosticism has a pretty solid track record of intellectual thinking. And if you look around the Gnostic blogosphere, you'll see that there are lots and lots of modern Gnostics who are engaging in these kinds of discussions in exactly the way that Dr. Hurtado was describing. And so Gnosticism can, of course, lend itself to that. But, you know, we don't know what the ancient Gnostics actually had to say about themselves in a lot of cases. But it's entirely possible that the ancient Gnostics were engaging in exactly this kind of debate and discussion and argument but the texts just don't exist. It was 2,000 years ago. We may never know if they did or not. What we do know is what we have. And so we have a lot of good, solid works from the Nag Hammadi Library and other sources that describe the Gnostic way of thinking and in a way that, you know, is confusing, yes, and it's hard to grasp at first, absolutely, but live with Gnosticism for a while and you'll, be, you'll come to understand this stuff, you know, a, a little by little over time and it, uh, and it will come to you, and you will have that kind of intellectual understanding, and also the deeper knowledge that comes from Gnosis. Thank you once again for everybody who supported our Patreon campaign to get us over our first milestone of $15 per video or podcast episode. Uh, if you have not yet, and you like what we do here, please stop what you're doing right now, Go over to the patreon.com slash Gnostic website and please pledge even a couple of cents per video or podcast episode. Every little bit helps and it helps us to make more and better content for you that we love doing anyway. And uh, now we're just getting a little bit of financial support to do it. So thank you once again and I'll see you next week.